Mortal Kombat is a game that's reputation precedes it. It took on the giant that was Street Fighter 2 and paved the way for video games that were targeted towards older gamers. The creators famously said that they were kids that never stopped playing and there must be more people out there like them. Well there was and there still is. Through its use of secrets, over the top action, unique setting and in your face nature, Mortal Kombat cemented itself as one of the greats. This is the story from concept to creation. This is the making of Mortal Kombat. John Tobias joined Midway in 1989 straight out of college. His education had been in illustration and he had worked on some comic books prior to that, including the real Ghostbusters. His experience of computer graphics was mostly self-taught, but he had always had an interest in video games and his first game at Midway was Smash TV when he was 19. It was when he was working on the sequel Total Carnage when the first buds of inspiration for Mortal Kombat would develop. This developed from some of his frustration working on Smash TV. The sprites that he drew were small and he felt as if they didn't really take advantage of the power of the arcade. Midway had been experimenting with digitised graphics in the years previously, specifically with the game Narc, and had a small studio. He felt that the company should take advantage of this and do a game of huge digitised sprites to really show off the technology. His first thought that the best type of game this would work with would be a fighting game, with his inspiration being Karate Champ from 1984, one of the best known fighting games of all time by that point, as Street Fighter 2 had not yet been released. One of the reasons he thought a fighting game would work is because it only required a couple of sprites at a time, so they could maximise the size without taxing the CPU. In the office next to John Spires was Ed Boon. Ed Boon was a graduate in computer science and he had sent out his CV to banks and financial institutions as he was under the impression that he would just fall into what he termed as a grown-up career. His CV contained a small reference that he had a personal interest in video games, which one recruiter picked up on and promptly sent his CV onto video game companies. He was often interviewed by Williams Electronics, to which he had assumed it was for a video game programmer. He was surprised to find out on the day that it was for a pinball machine programmer, to which he stated he didn't even realise people programmed pinball machines. Despite this faux pas, he was offered the job, and through the interview process, he met some people he had great respect for, including the guys that had created Joust and Defender, which massively increased his enthusiasm for the role. Throughout the first three years of his tenure at Williams, Boone was programming pinball machines. From time to time, he would hang out with people in the video game department. It was a small enough company that he was able to help out on those games without affecting his day job too much. He assisted with Williams' digitised game NARC before joining the department fully to work on football games high impact and super high impact. John Tobias knew that his idea for a digitised fighting game had legs, but he needed to flesh out the idea. He was friends with a local fitness trainer and martial artist Daniel Pacina, and asked for his help in presenting a pitch to Midway. Along with his other friends, Carlos Pacina and Rich Divizio, the gang snuck into Midway in order to film a small pitch using the studio that Midway had set up. They filmed themselves doing martial arts moves and talked about Chinese ninjas and mysterious powers. John Tobias had more than just a basic outline in his head by this point. He wanted to create something that was a mashup of all of his influences growing up. He was a huge martial arts movie junkie and during his high school years would go to theatres showing triple marathons of Hong Kong action movies. A lot of the inspiration would come from this. He was specifically interested in creating something which took the realism of the West and combined it with the mysticism of the East. Although Big Trouble in Little China had some obvious influences, he has stated that one of the biggest was that of the movies of Sui Hark, specifically Zoo Warriors and The Swordsman, which he used to have to get on bootleg VHS tapes. Tobias presented his ears to Ed Boon and Ed liked it. He thought that a grittier fighting game could really work, but when he showed it to the management, they wasn't convinced that it could sell. At the time, fighting games were not doing too well, and even the most successful like Pit Fighter were of lacklustre quality. They believed that a licensing deal would work, and coincidentally, they had recently been contacted by the producers of Universal Soldier to create a video game tie-in. Whilst they didn't think that would work for this project, they did like the idea of creating a game fronted by Jean-Claude Van Damme. Negotiations went on, but ultimately it got nowhere, with it seeming as if his agent wanted to keep them on the line without ever fully committing. In 1991, Street Fighter 2 came out and took the world by storm. This led the management of Midway to look back at Tobias' original ideas and decide that it would be able to stand on its own two feet. They had a slot for a release date the next year, so the game would have to be completed in just eight months' time. Tobias would later credit this line of events 
for being one of the reasons why the game was successful, because he had come up with all the ideas before Street Fighter 2 was released. It wasn't dismissed as a clone, as so many other post Street Fighter 2 fighters were. When they came to start developing the game in earnest, they took a look at their target audience. At this point, the arcade market had changed significantly since the mid 80s. The main arcade goer was people in college age, as most younger gamers had shifted to home consoles. This is what led to the idea of creating something grittier, with violence akin to an action movie for teenagers and adults, rather than something for children. Whilst they never specifically set out to make the game have over the top violence, it evolved as the game evolved. They added a bit more blood here, another squirt there, then sounds were added and the screen shook, and when fatalities were added, they got more and more creative, as they didn't feel they had any set limits. They felt what they was creating was so over the top, it could never be taken seriously as real violence. When Tobias came to firm up the design, as the game's development was starting, he was frustrated with the coin art medium, and the inability to be able to tell a real story with it. It simply wasn't possible to tell a full story in the short bursts of gameplay that the arcade scene required. This meant that he had to attempt to craft some kind of story without exposition. He thought that keeping the scenario simple and giving each character a specific archetype would help in that goal. As you can see from his notes, originally each character had a clear archetype, which would show which role they were supposed to be playing in this story. Players would be able to gather this from the short bios at the start of the game, and eventually from the spin-off mediums or comic books and home console releases, which would flesh out the world further. Tobias had always felt that Chinese mythology could be rather vague, and he drew upon this when creating his characters. Liu Kang and Shang Tsung would represent a yin and yang in the game, and he was interested in seeing the connections the players would make themselves, when they were only presented with a small part of the story, and couldn't see the big picture that the developers did. These connections that he observed players making went a big way in influencing how he developed the story in the future. Ed Boon later said that many fighting games of the time had stories that were so vague, players couldn't figure out why they were fighting each other. But thanks to the effort that Tobias put in, this was never a problem with Mortal Kombat, and they had plenty of material to work with when they started licensing out the franchise. Much of the character's backstory had been fleshed out by Tobias in his early notes and sketches, and they remained fairly similar to the final product, though there were some differences. An early version of Liu Kang had him named Yoshitsune Minamoto, a Japanese warrior. This design was axed, with his character becoming a more generic Shaolin monk style fighter, but the eventual design took elements from both Yoshitsune and the Shaolin monk Liu Kang. Other characters went through similar changes. Sub-Zero was originally called Tundra and was one of two ninjas, whilst Johnny Cage was called Michael Grimm, who was simply supposed to be a psychic of the protagonist. Daniel Pacina that portrayed Johnny Cage thought that the character was based off Danny Rand from the Marvel comic Iron Fist, however Tobias himself has pointed it to being a pastiche of Van Damme and other Hollywood martial artists. Other characters like Raiden emerged virtually identical to Tobias' original sketches of them, barely changing. His original spark for Raiden came from the Japanese thunder god called Raiden, which he had first found out about due to a statue in Chicago's Field Museum. He took the name and the legend, but dropped the other similarities, as the statue was a giant demon carrying a large drum. There was originally a character called Rokuro, which is based on a creature from Japanese folklore. Eventually, elements of this character were folded into the boss character, then called Gongoro, which was a sort of four-armed barbarian. He thought of Goro because he wanted to have a brutish character as the boss, and thought of Ray Harryhausen films, like Jason and the Argonauts, with the idea that it could be a stop-motion puppet. He drew up several sketches of the character, including a version with Goro with a tail. The character was finalised by the sculptor Kurt Chiarelli, who designed the puppet. Kurt took the design that Tobias had given him, and replicated it faithfully. However, he tweaked it slightly, so that it had the appearance of being anatomically correct, maintaining the illusion of a creature that could function, but keeping the design relatively simple and clean. The finished model was 12 inches tall, and they animated him against the blue screen background using stop motion. Many of the combatants' personality and design came from the actors portraying them. Liu Kang was originally supposed to be a bald Shaolin monk, but Ho Sung Pak refused to shave his head for the part, so he kept his hair. Daniel Pacina said that during the initial recordings, they would spend 8 hours a day in front of the camera, performing every kind of martial arts move they could think of, talking about their characters, discussing their personalities and what special moves they could have, and what their fatalities would be. Kirk Chiarelli later described this creative atmosphere as a crazy combative bunch of Southside dreamers, intellectuals, poets and spirit artists. Pacina became an informal leader of the actors, showing them how to perform the moves in the same way that he did. They had a silver pulse out with a red tape at eye level and at waist level, so they would do low punches and kicks at the lower red tape 
and high punches and kicks at the higher red tape. This meant that all the player sprites would be roughly lined up in what they were doing, and could be scaled accordingly. Kano originally had an eye patch, but this changed to a half mask, which was supposed to replicate the Terminator. Richard Divizio, that portrayed Kano, remembers this as being a Phantom of the Opera mask from a local shop, whilst John Tobias remembers this as being a Mardi Gras mask that he'd cut in half. Either way, they started off by using spirit gum to stick to his face before it ran out and they used regular glue which took his skin away when they removed it. Despite the creative atmosphere, there were plenty of ideas which didn't make it into the final game. One of these was the clothes of the characters becoming increasingly torn as the battle went on, or the characters becoming more bloody and bruised. Another was some of the more gory fatalities, such as a character being scalped and having their brain eaten, which Ed Boon thought was crossing the line. The idea of fatalities came from how Dizzy's worked in Street Fighter 2. They thought these were a little lame, as there was a free hit but lacked impact. They wanted a way to end a match in style, and gradually the idea of a final move formed. Ed Boon commented that they needed a way to finish the guy off, and the term finish him was born from that. This evolved to the idea of the fatality, a brutal ending move which would finish a fight in style. The ideas for the fatalities came from lots of places, either in the acting sessions themselves, or simply from their own time. Ed Boon came up with Johnny Cage's uppercut fatality as he was driving home one night from KFC. Mortal Kombat has become known for its dragon symbol, and this came from a small statue that Ken Fidesna had on his desk. John Vogel, that did all the backgrounds in the game, digitised the statue and used it in the backgrounds. John Tobias took this same statue and used it in his reference for the arcade cabinet's artwork, which eventually became the circular dragon symbol and the icon for the entire franchise. This almost didn't come to be, as one night when he was working on it, his sister said it looked like a seahorse, which led him to almost abandon the design, but instead, he refined it and used it anyway. During the development, they was incredibly conscious about being referred to as a Street Fighter 2 clone. John Tobias has said in interviews that he specifically played Street Fighter 2 during development to see what they did and how that game worked and to try and do things differently and be unique. Tobias stated that when they was creating the endings for each of the characters, they didn't think of them as being particularly canon. There was outrageous what if scenarios. As there was no specific winner of the tournament, they could decide which one was true in the next game. One idea which was dropped was to make the game contain six fight buttons, high punch, medium punch, low punch, high kick, medium kick, low kick, but they found it was too difficult for people to play. Dan Forden created virtually all the music and sound effects used in the game and engineered a score that was unique for its time. Arcade games often had loud, bright music that was catchy and attractive, whereas Mortal Kombat went the other way and created a dark, foreboding soundtrack that matched the atmosphere the game was attempting to create. It helped set it apart and gave it a more adult feel, as well as influencing the tone of the series, distancing itself from the kung fu aspects and focusing more on the mystical and otherworldly factors. You'll notice that there are plenty of people in the game's credits that I haven't mentioned. This is because at the time, Midway was a fairly small company. Whilst they would have four or five people principally working on the game, other people that worked there would dip in and out and help when needed, but didn't have to find roles, so their contribution to the game is impossible to truly know. Imagine if someone asked you what you did at work one particular day 30 years ago, you would never remember. Now the game was nearing completion, it needed a name. They experimented with lots of different names during development, with some like Ultimate Kumai and Dragon Attack being high on their list. Eventually, they settled on Mortal Kombat. There are two stories on how it became Mortal Kombat. The first was that the name was written on a whiteboard one day and Steve Ritchie simply came along and overwrote the C with a K. Another story it's simply that their legal team said they couldn't trademark combat and needed to change it. Whatever the story, when they saw Mortal Kombat in all its glory, the name stuck and they never reconsidered it. The first tests of the game performed extremely well. They did so well in fact, that the president of Midway decided to give them more time, two extra months, and asked them to include another character. This character became Sonya, portrayed by Liz Malecki, another local fitness instructor. They wanted to add a female character, so took the backstory of another design Tobias had made for a character called Curtis Stryker and applied it to Sonya. She was wearing green as she was special forces, but also dressed in a jumpsuit which would be more suited to exercise than fighting. John Tobias remembers the first time he knew that the game would be a hit. It was the night that the Chicago Bulls had won their second NBA championship and the city was in celebration. He went to an arcade that was playtesting the game and was worried that nobody would be around to play it. People did eventually come in, including a 12 year old kid whom the arcade owner has said was magnetised to the machine ever since it was brought in. When he ran out of money, he simply waited and watched other gamers play it. 
He even told all the other players about a fatality he'd witnessed the day before, which nobody else believed in was real. When they opened up the coin box, it was overflowing. John Tobias described that as a holy shit moment, and that kid as the first true hardcore Mortal Kombat fan. Mortal Kombat was a smash hit. Gamers loved the unique atmosphere and interesting characters, and the game was able to set itself apart from other fighters with the bloody gameplay and fatalities, giving it a clear separation from the Japanese fighters of the time and marking it as something brand new. Mortal Kombat got so big that some magazines started to refer to the battle between Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter 2 as Arcade War 1, a reference to World War 1. Ed Boon believed that Mortal Kombat didn't only change the appetite games companies had for more adult games, but also change its attitudes towards developers. The credits of Mortal Kombat feature the game's creators names proudly and boldly, which was something of a rarity at the time. Many games companies did not allow this, with some going as far as to keep the creators secret. Ed Boon and John Tobias developed a rockstar like following after the game came out, and helped create the idea of game developers being ambassadors for a video game series, rather than people simply working on it. Mortal Kombat developed a reputation for secrets, in part this is due to how the arcade market worked. Each arcade machine could have multiple revisions, which changed parts of the game's code or add new features. This meant that a gamer could play a game one day and then come back to play it another without realising they had been updated. This led to situations in which events could happen on one machine that couldn't happen on another. One example of this is Reptile that was added to the third revision of the game. Reptile was a secret character that if he was on the pit stage and had a silhouette fly past the moon and then win a double flawless victory without blocking, you'd be able to fight Reptile on the floor of the pit. Ed Boon has said that this was his favourite secret, and the reason that he decided to add it in was because he noticed the mystery around the character of Sheng Long in Street Fighter 2. People would guess as to the true nature of Sheng Long, but ultimately it was little more than a piece of text. He thought it would be cool if there was actually genuine secrets in the game, so he went about adding some. He wanted it to be so rare that it wasn't easily duplicated, and that people would never believe it unless they saw it with their own eyes. Ed Boon went into the code one day, changed the colour palette of Scorpion and created the conditions necessary in order to fight Reptile. Ed even hid the existence of Reptile internally, as he felt that people within the company would not be able to keep the secret safe. He didn't even tell John Tobias, who said in an interview with GamePro that he didn't want to know, as he felt that if Boon told him all the secrets he had added to the game, he'd feel an obligation to tell friends and colleagues, and the secret would come out. These secrets became a staple of the series. However, there were examples of rumours which were born from misunderstanding rather than actually being secrets. One such example is Ermac. The internal diagnostics of the machine were set up in such a way that if an error occurred, it would increase the count of a macro named Ermac. This count was incidentally listed alongside the counts for how often the other player characters were picked so that the publisher could get an idea of the character's popularity. Unfortunately, people that had access to the game's internals misinterpreted this as there being another secret character and their rumours spread like wildfire. But ultimately, it was a simple urban legend, with Ermac being removed in the fourth version of the game. There were other urban legends too, which eventually made it into the game, such as animalities, other characters, and much, much more. I haven't talked about the controversy of the game, nor the fact that it spawned the creation of a video game's rating system. That's because at this point, there really wasn't that much controversy. When it was just out in the arcades, the audience was mostly older kids, while the parents simply didn't notice the game enough to care. It was only when it was ported to home consoles that the controversies really started up, in part due to Acclaim's huge mass marketing of the home releases with their Mortal Monday campaign. In this video, I'm not going to talk about the home ports. Recently, DF Retro did a fantastic video in which they deep dive into all the home releases of the original Mortal Kombat, so if you want to know more about them, I recommend giving that a watch as it will give you everything you need to know. Mortal Kombat is a game with a true legacy. Ed Boon has claimed that this legacy comes from the fact that it has a great personality and never took itself too seriously. He thought that the over the top nature of the game, combined with a strong backstory, meant it was a franchise which was unique and could stick in people's minds. It's certainly true that Mortal Kombat became a staple of arcades and thanks to the worldwide attention it got after the home releases, became a symbol of the video game industry, something rebellious and fun that could be enjoyed at any age. It's a con of giant and whilst arguments will rage on which is better, it's true that it's managed to stand the test of time. Thanks for watching this video. If you like what you see, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Make sure you tick the notification bell, otherwise YouTube just won't recommend my videos. 
I also have a Discord channel if you want to come and chat, and you can also join my channel as a member if you want to help support my content. Feel free to share this video anywhere you like, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, anywhere's fine. Thanks for watching. Goodbye!